Welcome to the Java Cafe, Java fam. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Today is Tuesday, June 6, 2023, and you are tuned in for another episode of Your Healthy Java. We are thankful for the partnership uh, with Massachusetts General Hospital, but today we are also thankful for Jensen US or Jensen Global, um, who was the sponsor of our Your Healthy Java, Joseph R. Betancourt, a health fair that took place a couple of weeks ago. Um, at the health fair, we had the opportunity to speak to a friend, a supporter. I'm pulling him on as an advisor um, into the Your Healthy Java space. And I will say this, and I know he does not do this for any type of accolades, but he was the person that liaised the relationship um, with our sponsor for the health fair. That's why we were able, rather, that's why we were able to give out the gift cards and all the marketing that you saw throughout the city and different things. And so I really appreciate Dr. Rick Lee. Um, who spoke with us about clinical trials, the health equity of it. And we're going to further that conversation this morning. So I'm going to ask you to do me a favor, hit that share button, invite others in to the Java Cafe to be a part of this very important conversation. I say often we've marched, we've, uh, Dr. Basola, the health commissioner said it last week, we've marched, we've rallied, we've called for equity and diversity and inclusion. But we have to be here to reap the benefits of it. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Go ahead again, hit that share button. And as I introduce and bring into the Java Cafe, a good friend and advisor in the Your Healthy Java space, Dr. Richard Lee. He is going to tell me to definitely call him Rick. And so I will try to do that. But um, Dr. Lee, good morning. Good to see you. Tomorrow. Good morning. Thanks so much for having me on again. I appreciate it. Please do call me Rick. As yes. everyone knows, Dr. Lee was my mom. So. <laughs> and I love how you say that Dr. Lee was my mom because most people think Dr. Lee was my dad. No, yep. Dr. Lee was your mom. Absolutely. Yep. Strong I mean, influences as we all know mothers can be. Absolutely. So let's, for those that have not had the chance to see you on um, when you were on before or got the chance to talk with you the last two health fairs, tell us a little bit about yourself. Was it your mom that inspired you to get into medicine? Tell us who who is Rick and a little bit of Dr. Lee. <laughs> sure. Thanks. Well, I'm, I'm beaming in from MGH, from the clinic. So I'm an oncologist. I'm a medical oncologist. Uh, that means I treat cancer patients and I specifically treat prostate, kidney, bladder, and testicular cancers. Um, but uh, I'm here to talk about, you know, all manner of, you know, cancer screening and cancer uh, clinical trials and those sorts of things. Uh, I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. Parents came from Korea and mom was a pediatrician and certainly a strong influence for me uh, entering into medicine. But I've been here uh, in Boston for 20 plus years, 22 years since I came to MGH. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that, that we that we at MGH are looking to do is to really like bring out health resources to our, to our patients and our communities. So that's why I really appreciate this opportunity to talk with you and the opportunity for us to do the work that we do together at the Health Equity Fairs. Absolutely. And what what let me ask you, as I often do with doctors, why why cancer? Why that specialty? What was it about cancer in different areas? What was it that uh, uh, pulled you into that particular area of medicine? Yeah, well, cancer, you know, is, is probably unfortunately, most people know it touches everyone's lives. And it's it is, you know, it's a devastating disease and it's a devastating diagnosis. So it's on the, on the medicine side, it's it's an awful cancer on a science side, or it's awful disease on the science side. It's a fascinating disease. So I was most drawn to it uh, during uh, school from the scientific uh, standpoint. But during my career in medicine, what really drew me to oncology, and so there's cancer biology, which is the study of cancer, and clinical oncology, which is the treatment of cancer patients, what really drew me 
you know, from cancer biology to clinical oncology is really about the, the relationships you have with patients. Because, and when you have those relationships, when patients get that diagnosis, it's really a, such an intimate moment of, of patients then learning a lot about, you know, what do they need to do to take care of themselves? What do they need to do to sort of fix family relationships, friendship, friendships, you know, what are they, you know, if, if, uh, if, if they're struck by this, you know, could potentially awful diagnosis, you know, how do they live their lives? And it really causes people to kind of wake up and do things differently. And it's that family interaction that I find the most rewarding in a lot of ways, very difficult. Certainly uh, it's a very difficult uh, disease and we've certainly had many sad, tough cases. But it's the it's the way that the, the patients and families rally that I find most uh, compelling. It's it's I I intentionally wanted to stay there with you. Um and and we actually have had not you and I have not had this level of conversation before. And you and I and you credit it often, Rick, that you know when coming into communities of color, of which we're both a part of different communities of color, it does help. And that's just generally with anybody when you identify with someone and get. A sense of who they are and their why it's so much easier to receive when they're sharing information and you say that often in the background and so i i i am glad that you did that here today but to stick with one of the things that you talked about um at that moment when someone may receive a diagnosis there are treatment options and one of those treatment options that we've talked about often is the awareness and availability and then in best case scenarios benefits and advantages of clinical trials and so can we talk a little bit about that like let's say a patient receives a diagnosis at what point should they say hey are there any clinical how does that how does someone even think about asking about clinical trials yeah so I guess uh, I'll preface this by saying that one of the things that, that I learned from the Boston Public Health Commission's recent uh, publication, you know, thinking yep. about thinking about that really important work is that uh, is that cancer is the leading cause of mortality for Black Bostonians. Or it, this is you know th that's important for us to understand, like as a as a first fact. And that's okay. and, and what that means then is that we have to do better at taking care of cancer patients. What do we do in the in the oncology clinic? Is that what we're really aiming for is to offer the best chance for the best outcome for each patient that, that walks through our doors. How do we do that? Well, sometimes it's you know a combination of various different modalities of treatment that we have, surgery, radiation, the, the things that we give in medical oncology, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, uh, et cetera. And so what we're really aiming for is that best chance for the best outcome. Clinical trials, you know, represent you know a piece of that a piece of that puzzle because uh, for some for some patients or for some diseases, we might not have a standard of care or we are trying to you know, improve upon the standard of care by bringing forward new drugs and new treatments uh, and allowing patients earlier access to that treatment. So uh, lest we think too much about you know, clinical trials being experiments, or patients often feeling like they don't want to be guinea pigs. These are these are you know certainly justifiable emotions uh, that people have. I think it's really an important thing for us to tell uh, to tell patients and tell people that clinical trials um, are actually opportunities for newer treatments. And in our world, in in the cancer in the oncology space, we are learning so much on a daily basis about the about the mutations in DNA that lead to lead to cancer cells being really really aggressive, and so what, when we learn about those mutations and we learn about genes that are that are turned on or turned off, and we bring in new targeted therapies that are that are available, well, this is really um, these are those are the opportunities that we have to bring in these brand new drugs and make them accessible to patients. So for for folks who are you know who are you know, cancer patients or folks with other diseases, clinical trials actually represent a really um, important potential treatment option. So trials are treatments, and we shouldn't forget that. I, I like that, and that's something I think we're going to need to keep in the space when we talk about this subjects. Trials are treatments. I want to back up a little bit because my familiarity with it, you talked about when you came to MGH. Presumably, you came to MGH as a, a intern, resident, and then fellow. 
yep. in this particular area, as someone that ran the admin side of a critical pulmonary and critical care fellowship, I knew that my um, fellows also did research in a lab. And so you all are often classified as physician scientists um, because you do the research with um, the medicine. And so I bring that up um, because that piece about clinical trials, and it's real, thank you for validating some folks' real concerns around guinea pig and whatnot. There has been some things in the past that are very interesting. We've named them, we've talked about them, and the valid concerns. But I want to just, you talked about it a little bit, that, that these trials are treatment. It's also, and you're not speaking on a, a behalf of official process, we're not naming any FDA process, but we learned a lot during COVID that the process when people need access to care that can potentially help, it can be expedited. And so with that safety there, can we talk a little bit about just, there is research being done. They're not just putting stuff on the market. There is research being done. Cause I think it's important that folks understand that. Yeah, absolutely. COVID was a great example of, you know, having a public health emergency that led to expedited um, you know, rollouts of things like vaccines and treatments and, you know, critical, um, you know, new therapies. Um, and that's the same with with uh, almost any disease where we've got, you know, ongoing research. There's, you know, terrific um, um, stuff that, that's coming out all the time in the world of, you know, diabetes, obesity, cardiology, um, and now Alzheimer's uh, uh, treatments. So, you know, the, the the involvement of people in clinical trials is really, really important because that's how we make advances. And that's, um, that's why, that's why I would just continue to, to go back to the fact that trials are treatments. Um, and so, yeah, it's true, but you're absolutely right. So a lot of us in, in this world, in the academic world are, are physicians and scientists. So, so we take care of patients and we try to learn from that experience to try to figure out what is, you know, an appropriate, um, next treatment for patients and bring those treatments um, uh, to bear. The, the, we've, got, we've got laboratories in the hospital. We also have partnerships with, with the big pharma, the, the, yep. the drug companies. And so sometimes that's, that can be you know, considered kind of a, 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 a negative thing, but let, let's, be, let's face it, pharma is where a lot of drugs are being developed. And that's how large clinical trials get paid for in that how large trials get 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 access uh, for patients to get to get therapies to our um, you know audience here and the message that you and I often talk about is how do we then you know make certain that the trials that lead to FDA approvals actually reflect the people the population how do we make certain that this is you know reflective of you know people like you, people like me, yeah, and, and you know, not just, you know, a, a, a 95%, you know, white audience or white trial participation. We have work to do in that. Can we, can, can we stay there a little bit? Because we talked about the benefits and advantages and awareness. And at some point, let's also just name when is the best point to ask about a clinical trial, but let's do a little bit deeper dive into the clinical trial and the process, let's say of the vaccine. My understanding is in that trial period, you want to get as many ex you want to get as many variations of uh, uh, ethnic and racial medical background where it's safe, um, age appropriate, uh, 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 extracting PD. They're a little bit different. Uh, uh, children, you want to get as a widespread of a population pool for lack of better words or patients because of why why is that rick that you want that widespread sort of uh piece when you're looking at a clinical trial what what why do we need to make sure that we're a part of that trial period yeah we so we absolutely have to know that you know the that drug x has the same benefit for the various populations of, of people right and where that's also really important is that let's just say we had a, a new drug and, you know, let's just say it get F, gets FDA approved and yet no one who's, you know, of group Y, you know, was, was part of that trial. Well, yeah. the folks who, the patients who are then part of group Y, and let's just, 
I'll pick Koreans, right? Just because I'm Korean. Like, let, if Korean people said, hey, you know, there were no Koreans on that trial. How do I know that drug is, is, is going to work for me? Yep. It's, it's a very important and interesting question. And so we need to understand how a drug or therapy or whatever you choose actually works for the entire population. So getting a broad swath of, you know, of citizens, of, of people, um, it becomes really, really critical. What, what, oh, let's jump right into this part. Um, mm -hmm. You and Dr. Betancourt jump in very well here. Where is the equity in 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 in, in laced line? However, we want to frame it. Where is the equity throughout all of this, Rick? Let's speak to where does the equity come out in this participating and things like that. And we, I see your questions. We're going to get to those in a couple of seconds, Pastor Marion. So. Um, where is the equity? That's that, that that can be answered in a lot of different ways. Exactly. Okay. When you said it, I'm like, okay, where it? How do we, people of color, um, extract the equity out of there? You, you know where that end of it. That's where I'm going for now. Yeah. So, so, I guess let, let's just let's just take it from my end, right? As a, as an investigator, right? And and then let's take it into the pharma space, right? So as someone who can write a clinical trial. You know, if I'm interested in equity, and we all should be, then one can create uh, one can create in your population that I want to have X percentage of this population to be included. That's been successfully done in prostate cancer studies. A colleague in, in Detroit did a really nice work showing that you know they wanted to make certain that their drug actually worked in black patients and white patients in, in their study. And they ensured that they had some 30% patients you know, enrolled were, were, black, were black men for, in, this, in this prostate cancer study. It's really important because we, as the ones who write the protocols, have to, have to designate what we're looking for, right? That's number one. Number two, I think that um, there are certain there's certain sort of historic ways that folks have been discriminated against and, and, and pushed out of clinical trials. One can look at a couple of different things uh, just as examples. Uh, there, there used to be a way that we thought about kidney function and there used to be correction factors for the blood test for kidney function if, if a patient had black or African-American ancestry. Now, why? You know, what was that based on? These are like old historic things that actually didn't make sense to today. So, if, but if you were creating a clinical trial and saying you had to have a kidney function within this narrow range, and that's that effectively excluded some proportion of black patients, then you are creating the problem, right? And so, there's been a real sea change in how we think about things like kidney function. There's been, you know, change in the way we think about um, other other sort of normal things, uh, to, total white blood cell counts, right? So, so in our in our world in oncology, you need to have you know a white blood cell count of a certain certain range for safety. But what we've learned is that the normal white blood cell count is not totally the same uh, for all ethnic groups. In fact, there's there's you know there are some groups, there's some uh, especially. Uh, African American groups, or uh, where you know, there's a lower white blood cell count, uh, because it was it, it's been found this Duffy Null phenotype, this this type of um, this these folks who, who carry these specific genes, it's actually it seems to be protective against malaria, and that's why they actually have a lower white blood cell count. Nor, but they're still normal. Yeah. But and yet, if you say if your white blood cell count is this low, you're not part of a clinical trial. Well, that's 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 you know excluding folks who actually you know should be included. Wait, 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 so the, the, this this is a good point to 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 transition. With we're we're not there yet. We have not reached the epitome of equity in health. And so now let's talk about with these advances that are being made and 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 more equity coming out. When you talked about the way of the trial and designing it, where is our sort of responsibility you've talked about this before to take ownership maybe delve a little bit into when we start to ask about clinical trials also within that you did name that it's not just within the cancer world there are clinical benefits and advantages and research being done across the spectrum of, of medicine and so where is how do we extract the equity based on the advances that are being made in, in policy and design of clinical trials? What's our responsibility for our health? 
Yeah. So, so first of all, we all have to be advocates for our own health, right? So, you know, we've talked about this before that, you know, that people, I'm not talking about patients, these are just people, citizens, our, our community, you know, we have to be advocates for our own health. This, this goes back to the, to the question of one of the attendees at the last uh, health fair uh, being, you know, telling our, my colleagues in gastroenterology that he was told he didn't need a colonoscopy. And, and my colleagues said, wait a minute. This they were, is, they this, were offended. They were right. offended per their tweet. Per their tweet, right? It, it, and this is really, really important that, that, that people are advocates for their own health. What I talk about a lot is access to care. So that's a responsibility for us in the medicine world, but also for patients, for people, right, to get access to, to their own care. Um, when's the right time to ask about clinical trials? Almost any time. So, you know, when we talk with patients about, um, of course, in the cancer world, when we talk, you know, with patients about their cancer, especially if it advances over time, we're always talking about, okay, this is the standard of care. These are your options ahead of you. Um, are there clinical trials in this space where you currently are? Not talking about like the, the distant stuff for, for people with much more advanced disease, but where you are today. And so we talk about those uh, that possibility almost at every step. So, so people should be asking, you know, is there a clinical trial that's appropriate for me? Okay. And that, that's, that's important for us too, right? Because people get worried that, that they're only, you know, they're coming to an academic place and everyone wants to be, you know, that we just want them to be part of a clinical trial. Not at all. We don't like you more if you're part of a clinical trial. We don't like you less if you decline, <laughs> if you decide not to be, right? We just want to give you, again, the best chance for the best outcome. So, and, and, and you said specifically to ask appropriate or, or you know, what are the chance, is there a clinical trial that may be beneficial? And so you want to specifically ask, is there an, uh, based on, because each case is individual. Right. Um, and so you want to ask, is there a clinical trial appropriate for me that can be beneficial for me? And Dr. Alabre said this often in medicine, there are risks, but he often said that the benefits outweigh the risk. There, you know, people say there are side effects with drugs and things like that. And so we'll, we, we want to name that and be real, but the benefits outweigh the risk. And so the way that someone, so you said that you can ask almost any time. Um, and, and let me ask you this. It, random just thought about it. When it comes to prevention, are there clinical uh, uh -oh. trials? <laughs> Rick, that was good. That was good. I know, I know. It needs to be one of those good. real moments. Yeah, yeah. Um, clinical trials and prevention, any correlation there? Clinical trials and prevention. And prevention, like clinical trials to my uh, uh, layman familiarity uh, is usually in a re responsive, reactive sort of space. Are there clinical trials that prevent, are there clinical trials that are looking at prevention of disease, not just treatment? Sure, there, there are clinical trials that, that are looking at basically like large epidemiological studies try to understand, you know, what are the people's behaviors that might, you know, prevent a certain disease, for okay. example. So, yep. yeah, so, so they exist. Okay. There, there, there are lots of those sorts of studies out there. All right. I, I just thought about that in the fact that when you said at any time, most of the time, it probably is when people are, you know, receiving maybe not so healthy um, information, but um, it is important too, I think, to be, a, if there's an opportunity to be a part of a clinical trial that is beneficial to you, definitely do it. And then the other piece about equity is to reiterate, clinical trials are treatment. And sometimes we're not, we don't know to ask, therefore we can't benefit from some very successful six weeks away from getting approved sort of treatments. And so if we could just reiterate that, we do have um, one question um, in the um and we're getting ready to take questions if anybody has any questions right now we can take them for dr uh for rick go ahead sir can, can i just mention also i mean yes. as you say it, it we also have to name it right so so we in medicine have to name it we as we like think about um the people who are coming up the the, the medical students the residents the interns residents fellows the trainees we also have to have to train them up right so we have to teach we have okay. to teach gotcha. about yeah we, yep. we, we, we got to name it. we got to name things like tuskegee we got to name things that like lit that have led to historic mistrust 
And we have to we have to name it because we have to be able to understand, you know, the the true you know cultural barriers, not just for you know Black Americans, for Asian Americans, for you know our, our Latinx, oh, you know, you know the it, all of these different medically marginalized communities. We have to understand this. We have to teach. So on our end, we have to be more inclusive in the in the things like clinical trial criteria. We have to influence the way that pharma allows us to, you know, not allows us, but how, the way pharma also rates, you know, clinical trials to be more inclusive and broad. We have to teach the upcoming, um, you know, the, the trainees, the, the next generations about how to really think about clinical trials and understand what we're asking, right? But then we then have to do this, what we're doing today, which is reaching out and say, you know, this is why clinical trials can be helpful and not just a dirty word. It, 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 that, that is, is one of the major reasons why we wanted to have sort of this series throughout the summer, folks, we're going to talk with, uh, we're talking with Rick today. If you were at the health fair, you got to meet, uh, Siraj and also Brenda, uh, Lormo. I got it right. If she's watching, yeah. um, <laughs> um, and so we're going to continue this conversation and Siraj is going to talk from the, from the farmer, um, sort of perspective about how it's important and how maybe he's advocating there and needs us to, to to take access or take advantage of these and and Brenda Lormo who's a nurse practitioner is going to come and God only knows what she's going to um talk about cuz she did everything at the health fair and just really kept it real but um Rick I did have, it's it's also on us like on our end yeah. like pharma and you know big companies are always talking about DEI and all these different things we got to make it real right we got to make certain that this is a real thing, you know, for for what we do and how we take care of patients. That is one of the things that I love early on, Dr. Betancourt, Dr. Labre, they named, you know, and, and I forgot someone else was on and they named, you know, medicine and they did say, you know, MGH, some of the research back in the day. There you see definitely an assertive effort from MGH folk like yourself, Dr. Betancourt, Dr. Labre and others, Coach Meg over at the professional that are really intentional about the inclusiveness. Yeah. And it, 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 it really, it really, um, it really stands out to folks that are trying to ensure that we get our community the information. And then on the other side, the community, we have to take advantage of it as well. When these points of access happen, um, Pastor Marion is asking, are all clinical trials done with pharmaceuticals? Are there any natural cures used in clinical trials? Uh, there are clinical trials that don't involve necessarily pharmaceuticals, right? Sometimes, sometimes trials, you know, look at things like supplements, those sorts of things. Okay. Uh, they're not that commonly done with supplements or natural things because they have to be sponsored by someone. I was right? getting ready and, to and, say, I didn't and, want to say it like, but yeah. Right. So, you know, th that's, that's a big deal. I mean, you know, in my world, in the prostate cancer world, there was one large study that looked at things like vitamin E and selenium, like a long time ago. I don't even remember who sponsored that, but you can imagine that these are, these are, you know, major undertakings that cost a ton of, a ton of money, which is why you don't see a lot of stuff happening in, in the clinical trial space with things like supplements. Are you aware, uh, and thank you for answering that. I don't see any more questions. Um, are you aware of any clinical trial, wherewith you can mention, any clinical trials that are on the horizon or available within spaces that we know that African-American, black and brown folks, BIPOC folks uh, often have um, trends of high um, um, diagnosis? Are there any things that stand out to you? And I, I will say I'm asking Dr. Rick this on the cuff. And so anything that he mentions is not, quote unquote, an endorsement. I know there's all these farmer rules and things like that. So if I have to rescind the question, then just hit me in the private chat. <laughs> but, I, I, you know, information is wherewith you can ethically. What is the best way to go about the availability of clinical trials? Let's frame it like that. Right. So there, I mean take your pick right there there are lots of spaces where um where we should be thinking about folks with you know bipoc folks whatever the term is that we want to use uh that will emphasize you know certain populations yeah um, you know and i think that uh, i don't have any any examples off the top of my head but um thinking about all the folks that you met at the health fair my colleagues uh dr azar in the sickle cell uh group yes. at, at mgh uh, my colleagues who are in the gastroenterology group, um, uh, Adwa and 
uh, Andrew, Dr. Reed. Um, I'm sorry, Adjua, I've forgotten your last name. Um, <laughs> the, in the breast cancer world, uh, Beverly Moy. Yes. Um, in the lung cancer world, there's uh, Leisha Sequist, Colleen Keys. Okay. Um, there, so there, in multiple myeloma, colon cancer, we had all these groups there. And, and I know that in, within each one of those disease types, um, we certainly have, you know, an emphasis on in, in trying to improve uh, equity. Okay. Dr. Uh, Rick, Dr. Lee, we're a little bit under time more than usual, but I really appreciate you coming and continuing this conversation and being here, being available and an advisor. Um, you, you just uh, kind of established that today. Um, but being an advisor <laughs> um, in this space, sir, because liaising that relationship to be able, and I don't have the exact number, but based off of memory, there were 39 on-site registrants. There were 50-something people that pre-registered about 30 or so of them showed up. So we had about a good 80 folks. And that's just the registrants, let alone the people that were doing tables that weren't part of medicine and went and got information as well, how they kind of cross pollinated each other to get information. And so I can I can say confidently about 100 people were serviced at that health fair. And so I really appreciate you. And there's a story of the tweet that the young man is going to go back and be, I want my colonoscopy. And there were others that got gift cards and just information and just it it, it was definitely um, um, blood pressure checks and, and information about vaccines and diabetes and just it was a lot. You know, I was struck by your show on Monday after the fair and the woman who'd won, I think, a TV and won a gift card also. Yeah. Has, yes. She, has, she went and passed that along yep. to, you know, yep. a neighbor who was. Yep sick and couldn't couldn't get out and you know uh, I, I was struck by that uh, for two reasons number one yes. you know paying things forward of course is is really important for all of us um, but also number two you know just thinking about um, neighbors and thinking about neighbors and friends and that it, that, that food is medicine you know food is food is health and food is medicine and one can look at you know gift cards to, to a grocery store you know um, and 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 think, uh, what is that really doing? It's doing a lot. It, yes. You know, food is medicine. And I think that that's, uh, I was just struck by that, how important that was to th like, think about that neighbor who couldn't get, you know, necessarily easily, readily the things that she needed. Um, or I think it was a woman. Um, so, you know, I, I was just so appreciative of hearing, hearing that as sort of an extension of, of what happened at the health fair. I also want to thank the other you know, folks who came from, you know, various Boston city services, you know, yeah. I think, yeah. I think this is a tremendous, you know, um, effort. Um, we had uh, next to us a table, um, from, uh, Boston medical center. Uh, there were folks, uh, from some of my colleagues from Brigham were there from the prostate cancer outreach clinic and the bladder cancer clinic. So, um, you know, it was altogether a great effort. I think the other message I would just have for your audience is that we're here. We're here, we're here to help and we're, we're happy to you know, take questions. If your group gets specific questions and referrals, we're happy to take them. So Rick, here's a Sia here who you would just speak. I was hoping she was in the room to hear her own accolades because <laughs> we were laughing. She got the $500 gift card, right. got her husband a TV that she said, I think conked out and did something and then paid it forward with the um, um, gift card. So she said health is wealth. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Health is wealth. You're you're absolutely right. It that, is in, in, in the in the the you know the Boston Health Commission report, you know, clearly proves that, right? It, health is wealth. Health um, is the, wealth. You know, and we and we saw the data from you know the life expectancy disparity for 23 year life. You know, unbelievable, you know, where you know we should not you know have race and zip code or census tract be such an accurate surrogate for life expectancy it's 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 disgusting right we have to work on this and these yes. are things that we can all be energized and, and work towards together that's, that's what we're here for I, and, and i was getting ready to say that is what we're doing i can't keep reiterating the fact that these conversations and awareness one or two people here today can 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 go out and 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 share with someone about a resource a see did what she did with the gift card but someone can hear somebody talking about they may have just got a diagnosis hey have you asked your doctor i was listening to uh, your healthy java the other day have you asked your doctor is there a clinical trial that's appropriate for you 
One also note of update, I don't know if you saw yesterday, and I don't know if you heard, there was a young woman that one of our shows, I think it was with the, uh, Dr. Moy and the Ellie Fund, where we were talking about breast cancer. One of the viewers went and started her process. She got her results this week. No findings. She's all set. She's all good. But it, 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 she wouldn't have known that, or not now, be on a track, because I'm sure they said come back in a year. So now at least she's on a track to be monitored and to go. And so if Nicole, I'm not sure if you're listening today, she's been very transparent. But that all started, Rick, from an episode of this for her to go and start that process. And so um, that's been the great power of your platform. So I thank you for really thinking about the community in, in ways that, you know, others might not. It could just be a political show. But this is a health show as well. <laughs> this is, you know. You know, there, there's so much about this that's, that's, that's so helpful. So I, I guess the thing that I would also emphasize to, to, to everyone who's listening is that breast cancer screening mammography, I'm going to mess it up because I don't know what the, the year you're supposed to start anymore because these things change. Colonoscopy, 45, uh, prostate cancer screening, lung cancer screening for folks who, are, who have a history of smoking. Um, these are really, really important things to, to pay attention to. So please, please advocate for yourself. See your primary care doctor. Get the screening that to try to find any problems early. Just because you feel fine, that, that, that's what screening is. Screening is finding cancer in people who otherwise have no symptoms. You don't want to wait till you have symptoms. Right. You want to get screened. You want to get this, these tests done on time. So if there are ways that we can help you do that, uh, we're happy to do it. This is not just an MGH thing, right? We're, we are here to like bring information to the, our most medically vulnerable, most medically marginalized people and want to make sure that they're armed with the information so they can be true advocates for themselves. That was definitely, and you cited it, that was definitely evident mm -hmm. at the health fair. We had BMC, we had MGB, we had MGH, we had the city of Boston, we had the public health commission, uh, just a wide myriad of, of, of folks because it is about getting the information out and access to resources for mobilization, for them, for folks to improve their quality of life. And the best improvement of quality of life is improvement of your health because health is wealth. It's wealth. That's that's a commercial right there, uh, Rick. Thank you so there much. Make sure we get you the royalties. <laughs> Rick, thank you talking. so much. Um, and, um, you know, I wish we were in a, a sort of a setting where we were sitting on schools and so the folks can see your shoes because I'm sure you were uh, <laughs> up in the footwear. That's what uh, Rick is known for being a passionate a physician scientist and, and uh, advocate for folks for health equity. But he uh, he adorns himself in some wonderful footwear as well. And that's our thing. That is our thing. So a, when you're in the church, if you're healthy Java, you got to you got to come right. So. <laughs> I'm not hey. messing with you. I appreciate you, Rick, so much. And Thank we'll you. be in touch about um, some other things. that. Are, and Senator Miranda, wasn't it her that got up and said, we need this done in the summer outside? So um, we're not making a... <laughs> We're not making a commitment, but there will be another uh, Joseph R. Bettencourt Health Fair um, soon. We're here to help. All right, Rick, thank you so much, sir. I will be in touch. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Stay healthy. Folks, that was our good friend, advisor, supporter, uh, Dr. Rick Lee. Um, it's taken me a while to get to call him Rick, but I'm doing much better with that. Um, but please share this episode. Stan, it's good to see you in the room, brother. This morning, good to see you in the room. Actually, we saw each other. Where did you come out to when we got the grip up? I forgot. Was it the health fair? It may have been the health fair. I don't remember. Um, but it's, it's good to see you in, brother. Pastor Marion, that's why I followed him, because it's a community. Oh, you talk about me. I thought you. I thought you was talking about Dr. Lee. I was like, let me find out you're on Twitter following people, Pastor Marion. Um, listen, folks, speaking of health is wealth. Um, and healthcare. Tomorrow morning, we're continuing with the subject of wellness. Um, Dr. Yavel, Dr. Yevel from Demet Community Health Center uh, will be here. He's a head coach, um, I, and I'm giving him a doctor title. He may not be a doctor, but Yavel Joseph will be here. He's a head coach with the Road to Wellness. Um, as you know, Uncle Thaddeus started this some years ago, um, and it has just prospered and taken off as its own movement, no pun intended. Um, and they do the 5K run every year in preparation for that health and nutrition, wellness classes. And so Yavel Joseph will be with us tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. to talk about the Road to Wellness that I believe is taking place in the next few weeks. 
Also, um, and Leslie, I'm glad to hear you got a doctor's appointment today. Don't be late for rehearsal tonight. No, I'm messing. I'm messing. Um, uh, so that's taking place on Wednesday and on Thursday. We did have the governor scheduled. She had to um, re they're in the pro we're in the process of rescheduling. And so as some of you have seen, and I'm going to put the flyer back up today just to make sure that everybody is aware. I've talked about it for some months now. Um, but we are finally launching the healing tour through a collaboration with the city of Boston to bring our residents together to talk about trauma, grief and healing. And so that is taking place starting this Thursday night for Roxbury at the 12th Baptist Church in Roxbury. Dinner begins at 630 p.m. Dinner, not refreshments, not snacks. Dinner will be provided that evening at 6.30 p.m. at 12th Baptist Church. So we wanted to make you aware of that. Um, I think that's it as far as announcements. Oh, I said that because on Thursday morning, um, Donnell Singleton and Ramilda Piera will be with us. And we're going to talk about the healing tour. We're going to talk about what we hope comes out of it. We're going to talk about um, the importance of community coming together, community working together with the municipalities and government and whatnot to rebuild and to enhance things in our village that are in place and see where the gaps are um, that we can come together as community supported by the city. I'm not going to say that. Stop saying that. Supported by the city. Supported. That's with the line through it. Um, so that's starting on Thursday. So we hope to see you there. Um, and then Friday, we'll be with Dee Dee's Cry at um, Encore for the Men's Summit. Sun Saturday, uh, Java with Jimmy is sponsoring a pop-up uh, post-Pride Parade event at Estella's. And then on Sunday, we are at Fenway Park. Then next Wednesday, we are at Embrace for the Juneteenth concert. We are at Embrace on the 15th uh, for their program at Mass Art. Then we get ready for the 17th for Juneteenth up at Franklin Park with Boston Wild Black. And then on the 21st, we're at Moakley Park. On the 22nd, we're back at Boston Public Market. And then on the 30th, we are at uh, the Healthy 617 Youth Campaign Closeout. If I can get to June 30th, we'll be good. All right, I'm out of here, folks. We'll see you tomorrow morning with Yavel Joseph from Road to Wellness tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., here in the Java Cafe. Have a great day, everybody. And remember, health is wealth and your health matters. Get it where you can. Peace, everybody. Mm -hmm.